Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the International Pollutants Elimination Network, the Citizen Science Asia, Earth or Ecological Alert and Recovery Thailand and the Echo East Coalition, we warmly welcome you to our detox session on citizen science. All right. So um, again, welcome to our first detox session this year so this is our first detox session and i'm so happy to see you all today detox is a digital platform for discussing um toxics and waste issues and a capacity building platform to help po's strengthen their work all right uh i hope you can hear me well uh can i see thumbs up if you can hear me well now all right Thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, let me continue. Citizen science recognizes the significant role of public participation in solving the biggest problems in science. It is an invitation for everyone to participate in science in which community members collect and analyze data on topics they care about. Also, for our participating organizations and partners to share best practices and promote effective local initiatives to make a difference in protecting the environment and public. For our objectives for this uh, detox session, so we hope that, um, we, of course, we're, we're gathering participating organizations and partners of IPEN in Southeast and East Asia, and of course in other regions also, we are happy to receive uh, registered participants and also actual events from several countries in the world. We want to uh, improve understanding of everyone uh, on how citizen science works, the challenges and opportunities, provide an opportunity for more IPEN POs and partners in the region to share their citizen science initiatives, foster collaboration and sharing of related resource materials, and encourage other IPEN POs and partners to adopt such initiatives. So we have excellent lineup of speakers today. We, are, we all have uh, the renowned experts in their respective fields. But before we dive in into the presentations, I'd like to welcome Ms. Yuyun Ismawati, the co-founder and senior advisor of Nexus for Health, Environment and Development Foundation based in Indonesia to give us the welcome message. Hi, Yuyun. Over to you. Hi, uh, Chinky. Thank you so much for inviting me and swap my role with uh, Eileen. Uh, it's good to see you all and I hope all of you in good health. And for some uh, for colleagues from uh, Muslim countries or Muslim observers and followers, I would like to say Eid Mubarak. Um, many of them are still on holidays, especially in Indonesia. It's a long holiday in Indonesia. Um, but I'm happy to join the call today because I think this is one of the most important components uh, within the IPEN network. Uh, and I'm so glad to see that our the legacy of our project from last year, supported by the uh, Stockholm Institute, Environmental Institute, uh, cultivating citizen science in Southeast Asia, um, have a, a follow up and the legacy continues with this detox series. Um, so for us as the IPEN participating organizations, it's very important to strengthen our core works and knowledge uh, about science because many of us working in toxics and uh, working on toxics and waste issues involving chemicals, names and types uh, in products and so on, which uh, sometimes or many times is not easy to be identified uh, quickly or um, we can analyze it quickly and so on. So with the approach of citizen science, we empower ourselves and also the communities that we are working together, uh, that we work together, or the impacted communities, especially. I've seen a lot of examples of um, grassroots uh, activities uh, 
uh, citizen science in actions uh, in various countries, not only limited to the Southeast Asia region, but because uh, I live also uh, and works also mainly in the Southeast Asia regions, I see more and more reports and media coverage um, of the, the works of the IPNPOs in the region becoming more prominent uh, in the media. And um, another task or another benefits or advantages of uh, the citizen science is that we simplify um, or demystifying uh, chemicals and demystifying sophisticated words of um, chemicals names or, or impacts. Um, either it's the chemicals in the air, in the soil, in the water, that you will see today uh, represented by uh, so many interesting and excellent speakers. Uh, and thank you, Chinky, for pulling uh, everyone together today. Um, you will see that the importance to highlight the chemicals and the pollutants in mining area, in urban areas, uh, in the water, in the river, and then in the air, uh, you will see the examples of uh, the importance of their works. Uh, through citizen science. And lastly, when we finish our works, it's very important to plan to communicate this to the public and uh, most importantly, to address it to the policymakers. So it's not only waiting for the uh, scientific papers to be published because it will take time. And so our role as, as the uh, uh, NGOs and uh, communities um, it's it's important to empower ourselves with data and facts that will feed the information to the policymakers, and combine with the uh, hard science uh, and uh, support from experts um, to dig further our works or our findings that will help our government um, big pictures of the issues and the problems. Because many of um, researchers or scientists are not able to penetrate at the ground level. And that's our advantage. Uh, our positions are very, very um, uh, good in, in revealing the, the issues on the ground. So uh, I hope with um, listening to this uh, detox series, you all will be inspired uh, and take notes or probably even collaborate with IPNPOs in other regions to replicate or copy or adopt uh, their methodologies and enrich your, your own works. Uh, and as in Indonesia, we also always uh, work together with the IPNPOs and also the Alliance for Zero Waste Indonesia uh, to share our works and also involving them in our works uh, from simple things collecting samples until producing reports um i think nowadays we have uh, the advantage of uh, social media and also technologies many technologies are now user friendly and you can buy it either online or and the calibrations of the equipment also are available online and with the uh, sophistication of internet connection, that's also helped us to um, improve our works using uh, technologies or, or toolkits. So looking forward to hear uh, the presentations and, and sharing from um, seven speakers. Uh, I won't be able to, to, to join until finish, um, but I would like to, to uh, to also participate in a couple of presentations. Thank you so much. So good luck for today. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuyun. And so happy. Uh, I mean, Eid Mubarak to you and to all Thank our you. Muslim brothers and sisters in the region. So before you, uh, before we proceed, where we are all looking fresh. So my, I request everyone to please open your video. Have a Okay, you. It's so great to see you all. Happy to see you all today. So we'll have a quick uh, photo opportunity. Uh, may I request everyone? Yeah, please open your video. Um, and then we'll just request our friends from Echoways to help us uh, capture. Okay. 
Okay, everyone? Uh, uh, can good I good request? To see you all. <laughs> yeah, it's so good to see you all. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, can we request uh, Ryan or whoever can help us in the photo op? All right. So, thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Okay, so uh, before we proceed to our next speaker, so just, uh, okay, just wait. Okay, so before we proceed, please allow me to share again the reminders. So kindly make sure your audio is on mute unless you call to, you are called to speak because we're using the, the meeting feature so we cannot unmute every, everyone. <laughs> but please uh, kindly, uh, stay mute uh, while you're not uh, um, asked to speak and then uh, this uh, is being live streamed at the facebook page of our co-organizers the citizen science.asia and also equaways coalition ipen c we also have from earth island also from eds and SCM. so thank you very much to our partners and then of course there will be question and uh, answer sessions later so you can ask your questions we can uh, allow you to speak but you can type your questions anytime at the chat box all right okay so we will go now to our uh speaker we are very happy me i am very happy to uh, be able to work with him, our first speaker and also our co-organizer uh yeah okay so our first speaker is uh, mendel wong he is the citizen science.asia co-founder and co-chair the community and organization were established in response to the lack of unified voice of, for asia in matters relating to citizen science the goal is to connect the regional citizen science communi communities and help share their stories Mendel is also a board of oh. board member for the Global Citizen Science Partnership oh. and external advisor board member for Citizen Science Truck outside of Citizen Science. So Mendel is also a technology executive in the finance industry, fueling his passion and facilitating solutions that leave strong positive experience and impact. So I'm happy to, sh to introduce Mendel Wong. Over to you, Mendel. Thank you, Shinky. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here first. Uh, so yeah, as I said, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you, Shinky, for reaching out and inviting me to this uh, important event. Uh, thank you, Yoon, for such an amazing uh, intro to what we're doing here. I think you touched on a lot of the great points there, empowerment, enablement. Um, and just by ways of a bit of history. So I think I noticed um, the event I pen had a couple of weeks back kicking off this detox platform. And it was it was really, really um, something amazing to see, um, to see it being onboarded in terms of citizen science as a as an effective methodology to sort of address some of these uh, environmental issues. Um, so I'm really happy to be here to be able to talk a little bit uh, a bit more about this. Uh, and thank you to the other partners, Earth and uh, Eco Waste Coalition. Uh, it's it's such a great opportunity to be able to have this um, short time to just have this discussion with everyone. It's it's the first of many sessions, I'm sure. So I'm glad it can help kick off some of the uh, some background in terms of citizen science. I'll do my best. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I do my best to try to give you guys some some background. Uh, hopefully, I won't speak too fast. I usually do. Um, I'm going to try to get through uh, my slides in the next ten minutes or so, and just to keep it to minimum. As uh, Chinky already mentioned, um, I'm the co-founder, um, co-chair for Citizen Science.Asia. We'll go into that a little bit more in terms of what we do. Um, but aside from that, I also sit on the board of a couple of related groups on a global and European um, level. And that's one thing I'll touch on in terms of where Asia is at compared to some of the international spaces. So I guess first off, just wanted to give a uh, basic citizen science definition. There's actually a lot of ways to define it. This is just one in particular. Um, this one is uh, a specific quote from a citizen science delegation that was deployed at the UN um, Environment Assembly back in 2017. 
Um, so professional science alone cannot provide information at the scales and resolutions necessary to understand environmental change. The dominant culture of scientific expertise does not account for different ways of knowing and often fails to engage the public. Citizen science emphasizes collaborative intelligence and co-creation to facilitate um, scientific and community-based solutions. It should become the bread and butter for environmental research and policy. To transform science, there's a realistic target to engage a billion civil citizens by 2020. So this is a few years ago already, but it touches on some of the similar points that you mentioned. It really does help fill, fill the gaps um, and also informally help cover some of the areas where scientific reach can't really formally get to uh, at the scale it's necessary. So what I'm going to do just to run you through um, in terms of just the agenda is really I'm just going to touch on a few things around citizen science, how it relates to the UN Sustainable Development Goals in terms of the opportunity there is at a sort of larger global scale. It also touches on a little bit of the efforts that's already been put out there. And then I'll sort of hone in back on in terms of Asia specifically and also what Citizen Science Asia um, does in that context of addressing some of the challenges. It's not something we have solutions for, but it would be just something to share um, and something to keep in the back of your mind for today's sessions as we discuss. And I'm really looking forward to hearing some of these other speakers and projects that are ongoing. Uh, so for a bit of context, um, there was an article published in Nature uh, magazine back in 2019. It was a little bit of a landmark um, output from the citizen science community because it really highlighted why citizen science data can contribute towards the SDGs. Um, around the same time, there was also quotes from the UN um, statistician, um, Jillian Campbell, who monitors sort of the SDG um, status and progress. And one of the things, um, as you already mentioned as well, is really the amount of data that's not sufficient to cover everything that's required. Um, so a lot of the contributors um, across the international space had already through multiple workshops and events, had worked together to try to understand how the citizen data really matches up with the SGG indicators, which I'll touch on in a second, uh, in terms of how it complements the traditional data, i.e. coming from the professional scientific community, um, to help offer a better insight in terms of our progress towards the SDGs. Um, so as I sort of mentioned a couple of times, UN environment is, is a strong proponent of citizen science. So just to give you a context, this is something that's well established top down in terms of um, as an international body is really well recognized as, a, as an adoptable approach to help get us to where we need to be. Um, and just to sort of do a little bit of plug for them, um, there is an upcoming um, Environment Assembly again at the end of May, and one of the particular events, which actually started in 2017, which is partially how we kicked off, is the Science Policy Business Forum. It's really an event that UN Environment had tried to um, collaborate between policymakers and nonprofits, which are sort of the obvious parties, but really bringing together with the uh, private businesses, because at the end of the day, funding, logistics, a lot of that is only really relevant when we're able to bring in the business um, context as well. So there will be more information um, on that if you follow us, but end of May is an event and it's open to everyone. So you should definitely sign up um, across the different workshops they provide. Um, so a little bit more as I sort of alluded to, as most people probably are already familiar with, but in case you're not, uh, on the bottom right here, I'm sure everyone's seen this uh, SDG uh, chart, highlighting the 17 SDGs that um, as, as a global community across uh, all the international bodies, we're trying to strive towards these 17 goals um, so that we have sustainable development. Specifically from a technical aspect, there are 169 targets, which means there are 169 um, metrics that we're measuring our progress in terms of SDGs. And these are um, measured according to 244 indicators. There's about 230 odd unique indicators. So there's a bit of overlap in terms of how they apply to um, targets um, already existing. So as part of um, these research that's been done over the last few years, um, one of the outputs, and just so give some context, is that it's, it's understood that citizen science can already monitor about 33% of all the indicators. Um, about five of the indicators already contributing, 76 of them is could be, so it really depends on projects and how they measure and how they provide data to address those. Um, some of the greatest inputs is to 15, 11, three, and six. And that really overlaps with some of the um, detox program exercise in terms of 15, three, and six. Um, there is a potential to contribute to all 17. So whilst I think a lot of times you think of environmental justice, environmental um, policies, really in terms of social justice, in terms of um, economical poverty, um, all of them can be contributable by citizen science. 
So we sort of get to the heart of the matter here. One of the unfortunate statistics also is countries in Asia and Africa as well, really on average has only about um, data to monitor about 20% of the SDG indicators in terms of official capacity. So this is where citizen science really helps fill the gap in our, in our space. So before I get more into how citizen science apply, but just in terms of the context of citizen science in Asia itself, um, if, if you understand citizen science, it includes like bird watching in terms of like watching the, uh, the blossoming seasons um, from year to year. Um, there is actually a long history in terms of citizen science um, activities um, as a practice in Asia, but really as a concept is relatively unknown and new. And that's where we're sort of trying to play catch up at the moment. Uh, and I don't think I need to sort of explain to this crowd, but Asia obviously has many, many countries, over 50 of them, and accounts for nearly 60% of the population. But at the same time, um, contradictorily, we're really underrepresented when we have these conversations around global issues, um, whether it's environment, whether it's pollution. Um, obviously, there is a huge challenge we're coming up to, as everyone knows, with climate change, pollution, uh, loss of biodiversity. So really including Asia in all of these dialogues is sort of one of the most important things to do so we can embrace the high diversity that's here. Um, so as I put out there, need to engage, develop, and coordinate Asia alongside other international counterparts in the citizen science movement. So with that said, how does citizen science on Asia come into play? So as I mentioned, we really were founded back in 2017 around the similar time frame as the Science Business Policy Forum I mentioned. Um, it is um, it is something that came about with our interaction with the UN environment. There really wasn't the presence representing Asia, so we wanted to step up and fill that gap to help connect um, the parties. Uh, we are a uh, officially registered uh, charitable non-governmental organization uh, out of Hong Kong. Um, so our belief and our mission is really, I think citizen science really can provide an opportunity so that everyone, the general public can contribute to knowledge discovery and affect positive changes. Um, specifically, what we're trying to do is really build grassroots connections, sustainable capacity, and tangible conversations across Asia to support this vision. I won't go too much detail into each of these aspects that we're doing. Some of this information, I believe the slides will be um, shared with everyone. And obviously, you can reach out and come to our website to check out more. But really, in terms of the three aspects I mentioned, connections building, capacity building, conversations building, We've built up a, a few pillars around these to focus on areas around community, which is engaging with the individuals around the uh, Asia region um, to help share their stories, understand the challenges, connect people so that um, there's leverageable work that can be recycled. From a capacity standpoint, really come, speaks to the fact that Asia is a little bit behind in terms of understanding the benefit or the usage of citizen science. So to some degree, we're trying to provoke um, promote and advocate for the uses of citizen science, but also at the same time, educate people. So there's a lot of school activities as an education pillar we've created to try to focus on some of these activities and work. Finally, around conversations building, it really is around trying to un, um, have the right conversations, whether that's from the perspective of individuals working with organizations, working with policymakers, uh, working with people who have the resources to enact some of these um, actions, but really is around trying to encourage um, conversations towards the progress of this. One aspect just want to also clear up is sometimes there's a lot of solutions that's being created without really proper uh, understanding the problem. And I want to decouple those two ideas where citizen science as a potential metric is really um, well suited for defining an actual problem in terms of as an observational um, effect of your environment. We can use citizen science data to really Put metrics around defining what the problem is and separate to that um, citizen science also helps to um, promote co-creation collaboration engagement so that the citizens are also participating in solutions that are obviously relevant and trustworthy um, to what they are looking for so that whole partnership idea in terms of conversations obviously what we're trying to get out of this so just to wrap up here with the last couple of minutes so what's next um, i guess the idea here is that as i alluded to there's been a lot of work that's been done across the years in citizen science. It's not a new concept, as I mentioned, but in recent years, there's been a lot of progress that's been made in whether the Americas, in Europe, and Australia, where the associations there for citizen science is quite strong. There's a lot of backing from the government across the EU. Um, unfortunately, in Asia, there isn't that similar concept. Obviously, there's not quite as much of a union across the region, 
but it's also very diverse, very eclectic in terms of examples that I could even pull out to talk to specifically, let's say, toxic um, um, waste um, treatment. So I think this is a, something that I'd be very much interested to be able to hear from you guys or people you know who are working on projects so we can map some of those to present as a story for the region. Um, also, in terms of project creation, there's not enough necessarily created specifically to address the, uh, address the SDG indicators. So helping make sure the output of the projects are congruent with the acceptable, acceptable data set um, so that they can be used in SDG reporting is obviously very important as well. And then the obvious point is to sort of continue to educate the community and other project leaders, as I mentioned. Um, there's also helping simplify the process of creating projects so they encourage more people to participate. Uh, and as I alluded to a couple of times, really encouraging those dialogues between communities and more importantly with the policymakers and statisticians. So a venue like today's with a detox platform, I think it's a great place to start uh, and it's a great way to tackle some of these challenges. Um, there's my information. Please do feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear from you guys, especially if you guys are working on anything. Um, check out our website, which was just launched a couple of weeks ago um, and do join the community because it is working with you guys that enable us to do what we need to do for everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mandel. Well, I think that it's really mm. great to be able to connect with you, to be able to finally found you. <laughs> Citizen I think the pleasure is online. Income. I think it's all about working with other groups. So be able to have this opportunity to speak with everyone is, is amazing. So. Yeah, that's great. I, I agree. Yeah. And then uh, we will have more, hopefully, collaboration in the future. All right. So thanks again, Mendel. So we will proceed to our next speaker. Our next speaker um, is Karapon Teb Thai Song, or we also call him Bob, Bob or Bobby. He is the research and technical officer with seven years of experience working beside Ecological Alert and Recovery Thailand. Along the way on his on-the-job training, Bobby realized that the environment and health couldn't be safe without grassroots participation, public eye observation, and integrated involvement of all sectors, especially citizen science. He specializes in environmental engineering and is responsible for providing scientific support like taking environment samples or sampling and generating data to assist local affected communities harmed by polluters. His crucial role is to address the industrial pollution problem in Thai society. Welcome Bob, as he talks about citizen science in strengthening communities affected by natural pollution in Thailand. Thank you, um, Chingi. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm going to let me share my screen. I hope you can, everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, I'm Bobby or Bob Akrapon de Tesong. So um, I'm the, um, the technical officer at Earth. And so um, for my several years of work um, with Earth and I try to tell you about an aspect on what Earth have been doing about citizen science, uh, how it works and um, how um, it's a process and, and the sequence and how we apply the citizen um, participatory approach in Thailand that we've been working with. So in citizen science, in strengthening the communities um, that are affected by the industry pollution in Thailand. So I'd like to um, first start with tell you uh, more about um, the story of Earth from the very beginning of um, my organization that have been working on campaigning on industrial pollution since 1998. So um, about to what to the cage already and um, finally um, founding at Earth Foundation in 2009 and the main issue of campaigning is um, the environmental and health impact caused by industrial pollution and chemical in products and the environment. Um, our main activity is the environmental monitoring and training 
and besides that, it is to support the community uh, um, in environmental protection and um, law policy advocacy, scientific and action research. And that's a broad picture for, for our activity. So um, let me touch a little bit more on our citizen science aspect in in our citizen science approach that being applied using in Thailand. Um, so generally is um, is to increase the transparency of industrial pollution management. That's one of the our strong points on working on industrial pollution in Thailand, you know, to advocate this, the importance of uh, um, severe problem from the industrial pollution. And of course, uh, we, we need um, the, to improve the participation of people, of the citizens at the policy designing level, um, at the um, policy making processes uh, and promote public access to the information. It's very important as well. And of course, um, to make citizen sign strongly uh, support community we need to establish the environmental monitoring network as well. That's, that's it, uh, the main work that should be done. And, and to promote inclusive approach, uh, include in, um, interested individual, professional experts, civil society groups, communities volunteer into process. So all stakeholders need to be uh, involved. More deeper in, in the citizen science and community empowerment. For example, one activity here is uh, you can see that um, we can help people in fighting with the industrial pollution and protect the environment and health of people. Um, this is very important that in this process, we, we will um, need to increase the negotiating power of local people to negotiate with the polluters, to negotiate with the government. Uh, that's um, the, a good example for our strong point on working with the community and, and uh, including them, the people, so they can have a uh, power to negotiate. And um, for our citizen sign and community power. Um, what citizen signs is, you know, in in my opinion, um, the citizen sign is indispensable too. Uh, is creating quality and reliable data sets very important. That is an essential condition for the community to have such um, substantial knowledge. Uh, the step consists of gathering data, evidence, proving the level of contamination, um, how dangerous the substance is, and analyzing and processing all data. And all those data has some purpose. The purpose of making this information is uh, from movement and campaigning. That's what we call um, strategic information, what we I'm going to use that information for. So uh, we, we do not abandon or we do not leave the process of making information publicly. So to expose the fact, uh, making people know um, the story of contamination problem that um, local people faces, um, awakening the government as well, and the goal of the strengthening the community uh, and the step of work are very crucial as mentioned. So um, I could go to more deeper in example detail in, in the, our activity. Um, today in our cases, I would like to um, raise about the air pollution. It's very crucial nowadays today. Um, for the first study is about the VOC study and monitoring. Um, at the um, very important problem that happened in the industrial area of petrochemical in Rayong. Many might know about this problem. 
Um, so when we talked uh, to, to the villages and we found a problem and um, their complaints, but, but, but having said that the, the government agencies cannot provide answers or assistance to, to the local people at all. Therefore, um, the very important basis is that we, we have to find a way to know um, what pollution is facing the community. And we want to make the truth known to find out uh, for the community that what's, what a smell is and how dangerous. So um, therefore then bring the answer to expose industrial pollution irresponsibility, um, push for problem solving measures and surveillance um, so that community can live in that environment more safely. That is uh, for the for the action on this uh, VOC monitoring. Um, we found the results of the air measure is that at that time um, caused quite a motion in in the industry and and the government agencies, um, the private sector and government agencies have always denied. Um, this as being unable to measure or not having the tools or um, cap uh, cap capability to do so, to test, to measuring, uh, to detect the, the environment. But while public volunteer joined with, uh, together with the Global Community Monitor or the GCM at the time from the California with the uh, uh, civil society, we found um, about 20 chemicals, 20 hazardous uh, atmospheric toxins were detected. So um, including at least um, six to 12 VOCs and sulfur compounds. At the time, um, Thailand did not have a standard or a threshold limits or safety level to compare with. So then we reached to the US EPA standard and found at least two pollutants in each sample exceeded the standard for protecting human health. Um, well, as a result, after about a year, Thailand has set standard finally for contaminants and in the atmosphere. So um, this is, I try to um, express that where citizen science and civil society volunteers have proven that air that communities around petrochemical plants breathe every day is hazardous and, um, and in high concentration. So, and in the process uh, and the sequence of citizen science did not just end at that point, but in the strategic information, the next process is social actions. That's another crucial aspect of the citizen science process is social action. Once we have proven the fact, we must bring them into the society and remind all stakeholders and responsible sectors that the pollution problem exists and it's all an unsafe level. Um, such activities include organizing press releases, um, presentation of our study, of our results, uh, complaints or submit the letter of our finding, our study um, result to responsible government agencies. And finally, very important, ongoing follow-up. And this uh, led to the beginning of the drive for Thailand to disclose pollution information to the public, to know what people are breathing in, namely what we call the community right to know and the PRTR law that we try to uh, campaign until today. So um, following from, from, from our, those process of citizen science and action, um, um, you can see here that uh, the action from the government, so the pollution control department um, finally investigated and collected a sample after um, civil society did, they did that as well. They found even more compounds of a hazardous toxin in the ambient air that um, we did. And 
following year, uh, the PCD then ha uh, have the policy framework the, on the VOC management in Thailand, the uh, monitoring of VOC in Bangkok and in Rayong around the petrochemical um, industrial estate as well. So that the industrial estate authority of Thailand and, and those polluters in the food area in Rayong uh, set up the VOC management plan and started VOC self audit project. Um, and finally, um, the Na um, National Environmental Board, um, Thailand issued the ambient air screening level of nine VOCs, nine compounds of VOCs in 2007, that the story and uh, followed by um, the 24 hour ambient air screening level of VOC as well. Well, that's, um, that's an example of what since science begins and started in Thailand um, that Earth have been working with. Um, more recent study on, on the air pollution in Thailand and citizen science is the, I would like to tell a little bit about the pilot project on PM 2.5 monitoring network and the study in Samosakon province uh, where it locates at high dense of recycling facilities, uh, small and medium scale of metal recycling that cause uh, um, strong the heavy metal contamination and pops contamination in our study that we did with IPEN as well. So under this project, that so-called Green Musakon project. Um, so the result um, from, beside from the scientific results that, that we um, work with the local people, um, we also developed the, the mobile application that can be used by public and easily accessed by local people and everyone. And also, um, installed um, 10 devices of PM2.5 sensors. So also um, including the activity of organizing the training for, for local authorities, um, for school children, and other besides substantial um, activity like sustainable oriented activity to reduce waste as sources and pollution emission. And from, from this, from this study, it's quite it's quite clear that um, main main um, source of PM two point five pollution that is toxic is come from industry. This that that's our that's one of our inclusion. So, like I mentioned, this is a pilot project, and we did establish the environmental monitoring volunteers, both. Um, local authorities and also the school children as well. And in, um, in, in the area, there is still a continual monitoring of the PM2.5 by the communities and very important and raising awareness about the two, um, PM2.5 and, um, and particularly pollution that caused by industrial sector. So, the third, um, let me go to the third and recent study that we that is ongoing right now on the air pollution on the PM two point five um, is the preliminary study on of PM two point five around the industrial area and potentially to um, to disclose the potential health risk. So this is. Um, to since since in Thailand um, today is the the complaint about air pollution is it's uh, very much um, from many communities many local people have complained uh, like local recycling facilities uh, in the middle of the farmland for example and um, other waste management facilities that um, that cause water and soil contamination, air contamination a lot, and increasing of um, severe air pollution of PM two point five. That's this is 
why we uh, want to to do this this project to uh, set up this project. So and one important thing is um, today in in Thailand it's rare study about the PM two point five from industrial sources. This is a uh, so then. We set the object, our goal to uh, provide the assessment of the health risk that relate to PM 2.5 that caused by um, industrial. And um, so to make affected people can monitor industrial pollution and develop negotiation power for themselves to negotiate with polluters and the governments. Our main activity is uh, going to study the area in central and eastern region where locates many um, mentioned facilities of local um, facilities and working with target communities. And we will develop the, the method um, of kind of taking sample of air sampling. And and um, of course, the, the strategic information is, uh, is, is in the role of uh, our process of working as citizen science. Um, and you can see this, um, the certain type of industry would be all those facilities that dealing with burning waste and um, burning waste and scrap and fossil fuel, like, um, Co-fire power plant, waste recycling plant, waste to energy, for example. That's where we will uh, try to explore our in our current project. So, um, last but not least, very um, the whole story of, of kind of conclusion of how citizen science um, defend the environment and, and health. Um, so we, we need to um, identify issue of concern to local community. We cannot just proceed the scientific work without community concern. That's a citizen science. And we need to capture local condition that is not mentioned or not being recognized by the national um, level or being or missing from, um, from national level national policy strategy. And the next process is to produce the information from what we have gathered, what we have detected, what we have found into reliable uh, quality of data sets by citizen science volunteer. So this will be a work uh, being done together with scientific expert and the local volunteers. Um, of course, we need to include the individual professional volunteers, the experts in particular area, and the marginalized community into the process. And then to bring the citizen science and all stakeholders together to sit together to develop solutions um, and informing policy making through citizen science evidence that reliable and um, and quality. So finally, to use all this into boosting action and negotiation power of people. So that would be um, in general of citizen science that uh, have been done in Thailand that my organization has been doing uh, um, for two decades of, uh, or so, yeah. For more information, you can visit our website. You can email us, uh, our Facebook or Twitter. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you to Earth Thailand for sharing your initiative. This, this is a really great initiative, which I am also amazed. Uh, well, we all know that air pollution is quite a difficult difficult to monitor. It's some kind of an invisible problem, 
invisible issue, the air pollution. But with your help uh, and with your efforts to maximize the citizen science volunteers, you were able to make air pollution, the invisible issue, to become invisible, uh, become visible. Okay. So thank you again, Earth, uh, and thank you, Bob. So we will proceed to our next speaker. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Cham Lorenzo. Uh, he is with the Ban Toxics Philippines, and he is the policy development and research lead of uh, Ban Toxics. So for BT, Mr. Lorenzo has authored numerous publications covering chemicals, wastes, and their human rights implications. He graduated from the University of the Philippines in 2013 with a degree in community development and is scheduled, wow, to graduate with a master's degree in environmental planning from the same university this semester. Jam will talk about citizen participation towards research and development in Filipino artisanal and small-scale gold mining communities in the Philippines. Jam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chinky. So I'll share my screen first. Wait, uh, there are issues with my screen sharing, Ms. Chinky. Uh, okay. So uh, again, uh, can you see my uh, screen? Anyway, yes, yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Chinky. Uh, so again, I am Jam Lorenzo from Band Toxics, and I will be discussing an overview of our work on ASGM. So as an introduction, Band Toxics is an independent, non-government, non-profit environmental organization that works for the advancement of environmental justice, health, and sustainable development in the area of chemicals and wastes with a special focus on women, children, and other marginalized sectors. So our organization has worked not only with communities in the Philippines, but also with communities outside of the country. So a brief overview of uh, the ASGM sector in the Philippines. So ASGM in the Philippines uh, provides direct employment to around 500,000 small-scale miners, a very conservative uh, estimate, and 75% of which are engaged in subsistence mining. So a lot of these miners only earn enough in a day for their needs. So ASGM occurs in around 40 provinces around the country and supports as much as 2.9 million Filipinos. Uh, the ASGM sector is uh, estimated to account for 75% of the total gold production. And Bantoxics 6 first became involved with the sector due to the fact that they are the largest source of mercury emissions in the country. And uh, pretty soon with our work, we were quick to find out that mercury use in the sector is uh, linked closely with a lot of social and economic factors. So most primarily mercury use is uh, driven by poverty. So here are, here are some of the key issues in ASGM. Uh, social and economic issues include the informality of the sector, indecent working and social conditions, child labor and inequitable wealth sharing practices. For environmental issues, uh, these include mercury emissions and releases, potential contributions to deforestation and land degradation and impacts to water and land bodies, which pose risks to wildlife and human life. So uh, ban toxics and the ASGM community. So uh, with working, uh, we've been working with the uh, ASGM sector for more than a decade. And uh, we, we have the shared objective of eliminating mercury use, improving waste management, uh, instilling decent work, and advocating for sector formalization. So we consider the ASGM sector a valuable contributor, collaborator, and co-creator to our work. So laying the foundation. One of the uh, biggest priorities for the organization was to establish formal partnerships with community organizations at the local, regional, and national levels through formal agreements. So uh, one thing that we are very proud of is that Ban Toxics is a technical advisor to the National Coalition of uh, Small-Scale Miners in the Philippines. So this has given us an unprecedented uh, a kind of relationship with the sector, uh, which has allowed them to move from being just simply beneficiaries to active participants and to now to becoming legitimate community owners of the projects and the research that we do. So citizen science is something that we consider in Bantoxics as a, a valuable component of community ownership. 
uh, of course, citizen science is concerned with research and scientific knowledge, as has been reiterated by the previous uh, presenters. And in the context of ASGM, research helps us in various ways, no? because first and foremost, this allows us to identify community needs and capacities as well as the ideal state for the sector. This allows us to identify what our objectives are in terms of our advocacy. Citizen science allows us to define our responsibilities and advocacies, what we can do and what is possible. So citizen science is employed in a variety of ways by bad toxics. Uh, for policy development and research, uh, we have had community partners who have, through the years, helped us through a number of ways, such as refinement of data collection tools and methodology, coordination with researchers and communi communities. This involves identification of testing sites for wastes and chemicals, identification and coordination with respondents, and in a few times where, when it is necessary, community partners have uh, taken the lead in collecting data for us. And as you can see, these three uh, items that we just discussed, uh, these are historically very difficult to conduct in uh, a closed sector such as the ASGM sector, but through our partnerships, uh, we were able to conduct this and that's something that we are extremely proud of and of course uh, communities have also contributed towards data analysis and validation uh, for our research projects in the past so citizen science also contributes to technology development in our case so number one is the improvement of technology through unique understanding of community co community context and capacities and bad toxics and focuses. So uh, nobody knows their community more than uh, the miners themselves. So uh, they have helped us refine the technologies that we have uh, uh, we have shared in the past, and they have refined our advocacies. No? Uh, for example, is the Benguet method, which uh, uses sodium tetraborate to extract gold without the use of mercury. This is a mercury extraction technique, which was developed in uh, the communities of Benguet, and which uh, Ban Toxics has supported in the past. Uh, another aspect of technology development is uh, community-led knowledge and technology sharing. So we have had miners from our communities who have become official members of Band Toxics, who have become experienced community trainers, and we bring them to, from their community to other communities so they can share the technologies that they have developed. And uh, citizen science also contributes to project formulation. So uh, uh, there is a strong community participation in identifying the priority projects. So a lot of uh, the project proposals that Band Toxics comes up with for submission to potential funders, these were brainstormed along with the community. And uh, communities have also helped us develop participatory monitoring and evaluation. So one of uh, our ASGM products is the Compassionate Gold uh, Branding and Certification Mechanism, which incentivizes uh, mercury-free gold production through bridging communities and formal institutions. So here are a few, of, a few examples of our citizen science work. So for research, uh, one of uh, our recent studies that we published is the ASGM baseline report, uh, which was uh, conducted in Camarines Norte and South Cotabato. So the full document is available on the International Labor Organization Philippines website. So community partners during the conduct of this study have helped us uh, in the identification of testing sites and with the coordination with site occupants. So uh, sites normally inaccessible for researchers and enforcement, but through the help of communities, we were able to access these sites. So uh, our community partners were also the ones who were responsible for identifying and coordinating with respondent child laborers. So they were the ones who were in charge of selecting our respondents, coordinating with both the child and their parents, and the explanation of the research purpose. And in some cases, uh, they, they led in data collection for both surveys and focus group discussions. This is especially important since one of the sites is in South Cotabato in the Philippines, which uh, speaks a language that's different from mine. Since I speak uh, Tagalog, we speak Tagalog here in Manila, but in Mindanao, they speak Visaya. So it's something that uh, it's another language entirely. And uh, uh, through the help of our community partners, we were able to overcome the language barriers. And uh, finally, uh, uh, community partners were able 
also able to help us with the analysis of results through both formal and informal evaluations. Uh, by informal evaluations, I mean, this means the ride home after uh, conducting research, after talking with communities, they will explain to us a lot of nuances that we were able to miss, and they will analyze and give their perspectives regarding the findings from the day's uh, data collection. Another example of citizen science in action is our technology development. <coughs> so, uh, Picture one uh, shows our South to South exchange program where uh, technology transfer between miners from Indonesia and the Philippines uh, uh, was uh, facilitated. And uh, another picture is our uh, Pantoxics minor trainer, Mr. Solomon Malagay. So we usually employ Mr. Solomon to teach the technology that their uh, communities have developed that are, that are based on uh, gravity concentration methods. And uh, finally, uh, citizen science is also a huge component of our project formulation uh, for road mapping activities and project planning. Uh, uh, citizen participation has played a huge role in identifying our research priorities uh, in policy evaluation at both the local and national levels. So pictured here is one of our projects between the ASGM sector and the local government units where they uh, brainstormed uh, different policies which can be used to in improve uh, transparency and accountability in the sector. And of course, uh, citizen science also helps us with needs identification and capacity building. So a few of our lessons, uh, it is important uh, that we recognize community expertise and knowledge as valuable resources because uh, no matter how long we work in the sector, the communities uh, may always know more than we do. So it is also important uh, that we push for collective empowerment and framing of community partners as equals and co-owners. Uh, I believe this is a huge uh, obstacle for a lot of uh, NGOs because uh, we, we sometimes find, we always preach participation as a key component of our work, but it's hard to view communities as equal partners. No? So it is important that we frame them this way and we treat them as equals and co-owners. So citizen science and research are, are not considered as end goals for our work, but it is, uh, but they are valuable components towards understanding and actual development. So this ends our short presentation. Uh, uh, I am again, Jam Lorenzo, and you can contact me via the provided email address if you want some clarifications or if you want to work with Band Toxics in your future projects. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Jam. I think now we all, uh, I, I, I am amazed with what you do, with what you're doing in the communities. So uh, just to also mention that the uh, mining industry is actually one of the, I mean, in terms of having issues, environmental issues and social issues in the Philippines. So we do have a lot of um, concerns in terms of mining industry but of course we also re recognize that there are a lot of uh, mineral resources in the philippines and uh, i i am also reminded that Tom said no if we are just to train really you no know, the communities they can be our co-partners and co-owners you no know, in doing um small scale that will benefit and may ensure also that there will be much less uh, environmental destruction and also health issues so thanks again cham you're doing in the philippines so uh we hope that uh you also continue that so um all right so i think we can we will proceed now to our next speaker uh, in the interest of time <laughs> let me introduce our next speaker um, but of course, I encourage all the attendees to type your uh, questions in the chat box. And then I also may I also request the, the speakers that if there are questions uh, addressed to you, you can uh, uh, answer the questions that in the chat box. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker is Eka Eka Clara Bodiarte. She is the journal editor of Environmental Pollution Journal and laboratory head of Ecoton. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the Ponigoro University, Indonesia, and has wide experience in implementing environment and health-related research projects and community development projects. She has been working at Ecoton for about three years now, and she feels that she can contribute more to the environment considering her relevant educational background. She believes that involving the community 
uh, in environmental issues is significant because the people in the community are directly affecting the environmental changes around them. And uh, from the many things also, uh, they also don't know where or to whom to report. Uh, so that, that, that I think uh, uh, Eka, Clara, and Ecoton work uh, comes in. So let us now welcome Clara to talk about strengthening women community initiative in Brantas River, Java, Indonesia. Over to you, Clara. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, experience to this uh, session. So maybe uh, please help to share screen from host. So hello everyone, I hope you are given health and happiness today. Um, African proverb once said, if you educate a man, you educate an individual, but if you educate women, you can educate a nation. It means that the role of women has a real impact in making change. Not only act, uh, has uh, housewives, but also have the right to be involved in any field, including the right to obtain a good environment for her family. Therefore, for the next 10 minutes, I will discuss how important strengthening a uh, woman in efforts to save the environment in the Brandas River. Yeah, Brandas River is the longest river in East Java and is even included in one of the national strategic rivers. However, the reality is that um, important river, which is used by around 90 million people still has not solved existing pollution. Even from upstream, the pollution is um, very big and the pollution in River has existed, ranging from plastic pollution, diaper waste, until the paper industry was shown in this paint map in, on the um, image. Next. From the result of community perception that have been carried out previously regarding how community involvement in river maintenance efforts, only 27% of respondents answered that they were involved, while 70% answered that they had never been involved or involved. Then the leftover and not sure if ever involved or not. Then from the question of um, how the community respond when pollution occurs it is very surprising that only seven percent um, of them yeah there to report it well um, active person choose to remain sound because they did not dare and did not know where to report then the leftover are not sure whether to report or not so from some of the question raised, it can be concluded that the role of the community is still not aware of river maintenance. And the respondents who were interviewed and who saw environmental change more often were women. This is because the intents of uh, them being a host larger than men. Not only that, sadly, they are uh, also one of the subject, yeah? subject of the rival pollution from shopping using plastic packaging until manage their waste. Women also do it. Some are thrown away like this picture and some are built up in the yard and some are um, burned to. Behind these activities, unconsciously, they are also victims of their oh. ignorance, such as being exposed to the plastic substance and chemical poison during host solution waste management. This overlap begins um, with the ignorance of these activities which can actually have an um, impact on health. Then the lack of the attention from agencies related to supporting river maintenance facilities and often do not involve them in river monitoring. So there is no place to accommodate complaints about the environmental change they are experiencing. Citizen science is um, needed as a process of protecting the environment by involving the community, especially women. 
because they also have the right to contribute the environmental change, not only aware of the activities they do and pollution in their environment, but also aware that there will be bad effect to lurk. The approach for the formation of city design has um, maybe various methods, but from here, Ecoton will um, discuss a new method to bring science that is packaged into an um, art or what is known as um, science art. We introduced a plastic exhibition that we call Branta Soso. Soso was taken from the words hug and kisses. It is also um, carry a mission to care for and love the river. This exhibition consists of several boots um, that we created for educational purpose. Women are invited to enter in botanists like this, which is uh, attached by plastic bottle as much as uh, one person consumes per year. Next. <clears throat> then we also um, invited them to get info from checking river water using a physical chemical parameter test equipment and taking water samples to see microplastic forming from uh, plastic, yeah, plastic pollution in the river. Next. Yeah, is uh, the image what the microplastic identification by the woman. Okay, next. And the last is by presenting a different uh, shopping experience too with the concept of minimal packaging. Next. So this, uh, this series of book uh, describe is a process of how to engage the community in um, the educational stage. But there is still several um, stages that are used to make it sustainable. Start from education, how we can make this matter to them. Then so uh, it can be um, become a story they will repeat over and over again. Even the highest point is embedded in their minds to apply in their lives. I think there are a different approach to um, involving the community, how we facilitate the community to discuss together and maybe be able to speak up to uh, environmental change. There is also need to bridge the gap uh, between industries to, um, to engage with uh, the society and also need assistance to take a uh, real action. Next. Yeah, this is a community engagement for the woman, uh, the uh, assistance with us. Next. So that um, letter, it can bring a extraordinary achievement for them, which is um, certainly sustainable. Like some of these examples, the women's community uses river bank. So to be planted with plants, they are uh, self value so that they can make their own MSME products. Then carry out direct environmental monitoring of the pollution around them. Then, uh, they can also provide education to fellow housewives in the scope where they live. For example, this is education on placing uh, diaper waste in the place uh, provided without having to throw it into the river. This place, uh, namely Dropo. Uh, Dropo um, is drop point postpack or drop point diaper waste. And then this uh, woman uh, involving with the citizen science about um, data where the diaper waste are thrown in dropo. In this table one shown that the diaper waste data in bringing an emergency that passed to prevent into the river as much as two tons or um, 13 and 40 pieces in four day. It is uh, a big, um, it is a small, small, small activity that can um, uh, prevent, yeah, prevent to diaper waste that unthrown in into the river water. Next. 
Yeah, this is um these are some of the women's communities the Ecotan has formed. We hope that the next step is not only this but can be expanded to several areas too. So today we all uh, already know how it turns out that the role of the woman is also important for the environment and can change uh, the situation so which can later reduce existing pollution. What needs to be installed at this stage, how we can provide this engagement process to them. As the saying goes, small changes uh, can make a big difference. Maybe we think this is still small, but uh, actually we are saving for the future for the sake of change for the better. That's all for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara, and uh, of course, thank you very much to Ecoton. You're doing a lot. It's not just small things, but big actions or small things being amplified by a lot of women in your communities or you're doing great. So thank you. Thank you so much. It is said that uh, if you educate women, you are you also educate the world. And uh, so, um, in the interest of time, remind the remaining speakers to please um, stick with the time allotment. <laughs> I know you can do it. So I will now introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is attorney Mark Pinalver. He is currently the executive director of the Interfacing Development Interventions for Sustainability or EDIS, a Davos city-based policy advocacy and environmental non-government organization based in the Philippines. Mark passed the 2016 bar exams and was admitted to the bar in 2017. He brings to EDIS his environmental law background a much needed expertise to an organization engaged in environmental policy advocacy. Today, he continues to volunteer for I Am Hampas Lupa Ecological Agriculture Movement of Greenpeace, and he is also a Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Professional Fellow in the Environment and Sustainability Cohort 2020 alumni, sponsored by the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Just recently, he also represented the organization in Germany during the Lenten campaign 2022 of Miserior in its partner organizations, uh, organization in Germany to call for actions for climate change and promote climate justice. So Mark will talk about citizen and community-based water monitoring and waste and brand audit or lava in the ocean. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank IPEN and everyone for the opportunity to, to present and, of course, to participate in this uh, webinar. So I would just like to share my, my presentation also. Yeah, I will not be dwelling more. I will just present some of the activities that it has had uh, before. Uh, where we utilize citizen science as a as a methodology in in research, uh, because the previous speakers already mentioned how important or has already established the importance of citizen science in in policy making and of course in gathering gathering data. And uh, with citizen science, we were able to improve uh, the reporting, monitoring, and of course implementation of policies on on the ground. And with that, I will be presenting uh, two of our activities where we utilize and, of course, mobilize the community in helping us you know, uh, improve uh, the water quality and, of course, uh, improve the solid waste management, uh, or maybe not improve, but also help us you know, in monitoring the solid waste problem in, in Davao City. So it, this is a... It's a Davao-based here in the Philippines. It's a Davao-based non-environmental, non-government organization dedicated for the protection, conservation, and sustainable management of uh, watersheds, of life-sustaining watersheds from Ridge to Reef in, in South Central Mindanao. So with that, I will be presenting uh, these activities that we had uh, previously. So for the first uh, discussion, I will be discussing about the waste and brand audit uh, in in some critical and crucial water bodies in the city so or with the urban wetland ecosystems and of course the river bank and riverine ecosystems in urban wetlands are very important uh, ecosystem in the urban area because they help 
uh, mitigate flooding uh, as a natural catchment for rainwater runoff. And of course, it is also an important uh, component as a carbon sequestration and of course, a habitat for various uh, wildlife. So it is very important to protect urban wetlands from uh, reclamation and of course, uh, great development in the cities. And right now, with the pressing problem on solid waste management, urban wetlands are being transformed into urban wastelands because of uh, because of lack of uh, regulation lack of uh, prohibition and of course lack of uh, uh, policies that protect and of course improve our urban wetlands these wetlands are being transformed into wastelands where people are just throwing their garbage and all of their waste now without regard as to the effects of of their uh, activities uh, to to this ecosystem and of course the river bank and river and system uh, right now uh, it is is also uh, working towards the protection of the Panigantamugan uh, watershed with the help of our Bantay Bukit or our forest guards uh, to maintain the water quality of of the Daba of the Panigantamugan River uh, in in. Uh, as provided by the Philippine National Standard for Drinking Water uh, because Panigan Tamugan River is being tapped to be the next source of drinking water of Davao City. Hence, it is very important and crucial to protect this ecosystem for, for the present Davaoenos and of course the future Davaoenos who will be benefiting for the pristine water of this uh, river system. Uh, in the urban wetlands, we uh, partnered with different institutions, the academy, the, the community, on gathering or collecting waste from wetlands. So before we do that, we orient our community partners on how to, uh, to account, on how to segregate this waste, and of course, on how to tally this waste and uh, come up with, with a list of what kind of waste are the characteristics of waste and what are the brands and uh, the number of waste found in, in these urban wetlands. So we, we, we teach them on, on how to properly do it. And of course, we, we, we gather our data and present it uh, to the public as well. So we, during the past uh, activities, we were able to identify the top brands uh, that are found no, in our urban wetlands. So these are the top brands of uh, plastic polluters uh, in, our, uh, in our wetlands. So as you can see, uh, these are known brands. No? So it's, it's very important to, to make them accountable for, for this uh, uh, pollution in our urban wetlands. So waste according to waste, uh, eco-waste management. So based on our uh, data gathering uh, with the help of our citizen science, uh, the highest number of, of waste that we recovered are electronic wastes. Uh, second, uh, recyclables, and we also have special waste and uh, residuals. So these are the types of uh, waste we have collected or gathered uh, in our urban wetlands. So our citizen science were able to to identify these brands and to identify this uh, the uh, the characteristics of of this uh, waste in our urban wetlands. So in our uh, river system, it is also very crucial. As you can see here, these are our Bantay Bukid uh, volunteers. Ate, Ate Chinky is still here with us in the photo. So these are our Bantay Bukid. Uh, they help us in monitoring the Panigan Tamugan watershed. They also help us in uh, gathering or uh, gathering or collecting the, the waste in our Panigan Tamugan watershed in order for us to know which kind of which brands are are found in Panigan Tamugan and what kind of plastics are are collected in these uh, areas? As we all know, uh, plastics contain toxic chemicals, so it is very important not to to keep this Panigan Tamugan watershed being the next source of drinking water of Davao City. Uh, 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 what do you call this? Uh, without any waste you now coming from from household or from from industries. So again, these are the top brands that we have collected and identified in our river system. So during this cleanup, we were able to uh, to gather or collect 1,713 pieces of different types of solid waste, such as plastics, 
cans, bottles, glass, cigarettes, face masks. Uh, we were able to collect face masks during this time because of the pandemic. But before we were not able to collect this kind of, of waste, but because of the pandemic, uh, it adds no, to another layer of threat to, to our uh, watershed, these face masks. So most of it were food packaging, plastic bottles, and household products uh, packaging. So it is very important to know these kind of things because, or to know this kind of uh, waste in order for us to, to know what kind of policy measures, what kind of uh, policies should be implemented, and of course, what uh, uh, the strategies that we should uh, uh, integrate no, in, in, our, in our campaigns. So these are some of the uh, 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 categories or types of waste that we have collected. So food wrappers, plastic bags, detergent, plastic bottles, face masks, used clothes also, uh, glass bottles, because uh, Panigantamugan watershed uh, is, is becoming a tourist attraction for, for Dabawenyo. So mostly uh, those coming from the downtown area go up there uh, just to chill and of course bringing with them some waste and just throwing it uh, on the river. We also found uh, or collected disposable diapers and napkins and tin cans and of course deflatable uh, balloons. And this is a very iconic uh, photo uh, of our Bantai Bukid holding a stick of face masks. So we, in one of our uh, waste and brand audit, we collected an, uh, 81 pieces of face face masks. Now in just one, uh, in just one day. So uh, in just for for hours, no, uh, we collected 81 face masks. So on our community-based water monitoring, we also. Uh, uh, mobilize no, our community partners, the Bantayo Aweg. These are youth volunteers in Panigan Tamugan Watershed. So Bantayo Aweg, or uh, in its English translation, Water Guardians, is a group of volunteers in Panigan Tamugan Watershed responsible for the monitoring of the water quality of the area. So uh, Panigan Tamugan Watershed, as mentioned earlier, is being tapped as the next source of drinking water of Davao City. And currently, it has a classification of Class A, so meaning it is very good for, for drinking. That is why it is very crucial to monitor uh, the quality of this uh, river or this watershed in order to maintain its uh, water quality. So we, we mobilize and we tap our Bantayo Aweg. These are youth volunteers. They conduct the, the water quality the, uh, water quality monitoring, and they also monitor uh, the nitrate, the phosphate, the dissolved oxygen, and of course the uh, turbidity of, of the river no? in order to know if the river is still within the uh, classification as provided in the Philippine National Standard for Drinking drinking Water. So it is very important to top community experts, no? as mentioned earlier, uh, because they know the, the area, and of course they have the human resources uh, as well. So with the expansion, uh, we are conducting this uh, uh, water quality monitoring because Panigan Tamugan watershed, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, plantations, banana plantations, pineapple plantations, and other agricultural activities in the area. So with the expansion of pesticide intensive plantations in Davao's watersheds, residents from three upland communities in the Panigan Tamugan uh, watershed in Baguio district realized the need to monitor the water quality of their rivers because it's uh, it's not only those who will be uh, using the, the the water to to for it to be drink but also the community will also be affected you now if this uh, river system will be will deteriorate because of the existence of pesticide incentive uh, plantations that is why it is very important to to monitor and check the water quality in these rivers so uh, we started uh, training the Bantayo Aweg uh, in 2005 and a decade later the water monitoring uh, the water monitoring has been continued no, by, by their children so our uh, older Bantayo Aweg became our Bantay Bukit or our forest guards so their children are now the next generation of Bantayo Aweg so we we provide them with uh, with trainings on how to conduct water quality monitoring. We also provide them with with trainings on on paralegal and of course on biodiversity monitoring and river monitoring uh, as well. No, in order for them to to know uh, what they should do, no, and uh, during monitoring and of course river uh, monitoring. So the data that we 
have collected or consolidated are also utilized no and we we submit it to different agencies in order for them to come up with uh policies to come up with uh regulations or maybe implement strict implementations of already existing policies no to to protect and of course prohibit some activities that would threaten the integrity of the uh, panigan tamugan watershed so it is very important that these community partners are are tapped so so with that with the help of our community partners through citizen science we were able to influence uh some uh policy making or legislations so with that uh data that we have gathered during our waste and brand audit and of course during our uh community based water monitoring we were able to influence an ordinance wherein uh it regulates recreational activities within the watershed areas of Davao City for the protection conservation and preservation of the natural environment and of course we also uh this data were also used no, to lobby for the uh regulation of uh single use plastics in in Davao City so uh we were able to influence as well with the data collected by our citizen science uh the the passage of the no to single use plastic ordinance in the city and of course we were able to call on the attention of different uh government agencies to provide a better waste uh, management effort in in these barangays or in these villages no in order to avoid this kind of situation in the future so uh the department of environment and natural resources uh acted on it they they said that they will be funding assistance for materials recovery facility in these barangays in order to avoid this kind of situation uh in the future so with that we all know how important citizen science is it's not just to to give these people an avenue to to you know uh, express or to to use their their talents but also citizen science promotes uh ownership by by the community uh it promotes inclusivity hence it is very important to always include our community partners uh in doing research in conducting policy lobbying for them to also uh you know uh be to, for them to own to own this kind of policies and for them to be more accountable and of course responsible for 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 the implementations of these policies as well so with that uh i end my presentation and of course if you have questions i am very much willing to uh, answer them thank you so much thank you thank you so much mark and uh edis thank you so much for your amazing work no and also thank you to the bantai bukit the forest guards and the water guardians please continue what you're doing you're doing a great work so thank you so much uh, you're doing a great work in protecting the watersheds in uh, davao city and hopefully also other watersheds in the philippines so again thank you very much we will now go to our next speaker so earlier with with the presentations we have gone to thailand indonesia and the philippines now we will go to taiwan so our next speaker is Yuncha Lo. Lo Yuncha Lo. <laughs> Sorry. Yuncha has been working as a translator, editor, and action coordinator under Taiwan Watch Institute since 2009, with a few years of temporary leave in 2010, when she accomplished her master's degree in Taiwan's environmental education and in transcultural studies in Germany. She has experience in introducing global environmental information into Mandarin by herself or by mobilizing volunteers Re recently yun cha devotes uh, most of her time to digital publication field work studies and podcast programs around sustainable consumer behavior she has also the local indigenous school for years to develop its alternative curriculum based on traditional knowledge so Yun Cha worked with several volunteers in 2019 and 2020 to investigate PVC furniture in big chain stores. It was the first time for her and uh, Taiwan Watch Institute to collect field data with informed citizens. The collaboration made it possible to broaden the investiga investigated area and it empowered the volunteers to inspect product material on their own. So while it takes time to develop methods or model of collaborations citizens involvement can always bring an environmental issue further and further so 
Our next speaker is Yoon Cha. She will talk about investigating PVC furniture in chain stores. Yoon Cha, uh, please. Uh, Thank you, Over to you. Okay, let me share my slides first. Okay, can you see my slides now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Also, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yun Jia from Taiwan Watch Institute. And today I'm sharing with you about a campaign we did uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with our citizen volunteers in around 2019 and 2020. Um, the project was about investigating PVC furniture in chain stores in Taiwan. Um, as you will find out later, the case was not so much involved with uh, science, but we did learn something about collaborating with a group of people in environmental projects. So let's just begin. Okay, uh, first of all, let me introduce briefly about Taiwan Watch Institute. Taiwan Watch is an environmental campaign group based in Taipei since 1998. And the issues we focus on are mostly waste management policies, plastic pollution, and toxic chemicals. Um, our regular work includes releasing digital publications online, uh, making podcast episodes about circular economy, and also we have to negotiate with government agencies on various environmental issues from time to time. So uh, let's just go straight into the case. Um, the title of the case is called Get PVC Out of Our Furniture. And anti-PVC has always been one of the uh, most important campaigns we, we do in uh, Taiwan Watch Institute, considering uh, the negative impacts of uh, this kind of plastic. And uh, in the project, we did roughly four uh, steps for our volunteers to in, uh, participate in the investigation. The first step was that we sent volunteers into huge furniture chain stores, as you can see in the picture in the left. And these volunteers were told to check product labels to find P PVC products in the stores. And then they have to take photos with their cell phones. And then uh, these people have to document their findings online. We have opened up an online table for them to key in the information they found in the stores. And after we accomplished the, the online table together, um, we held a press conference with some of the volunteers to publicize the results of our investigation in hope that the corporation can uh, give some response to the issue. So this is for a general picture. Uh, this is a, a, a for you to, to have a general picture about uh, the uh, case. And now we would like to go into the details um, of the project. So before the uh, action, we the staff of Taiwan Watch did a pre-action investigation in different brands of furniture stores in Taiwan. So basically, we went to these two stores, IKEA and Teliwu. Teliwu uh, is called Test Right Retail, which is a local business in Taiwan. And to see how much, uh, how many PVC products are sold in these two stores so that we can decide which investigation sites we're going to send our um, volunteers. And eventually we decided that uh, we will do the investigation only in Test Right Retail because we we practically didn't find any PVC product in IKEA to our surprise. So uh, Teliwu or Test Right Retail has become our target of investigation. And after we have made the research question and also the location, we started to recruit the volunteers online. So what we did was that we spread the message among our volunteers. So we've already known these people before and, and some of them we've already worked with once or twice before. And uh, eventually we got around 10 volunteers who were willing to be our investigators in the chain stores. And then um, we, uh, we formed a line group with these people together for contact. I don't know if you are familiar with this app, Line, um, but it was an efficient tool for us during the time of the pandemic. So everything was contact through uh, these uh, uh, online app. And um, we explained everything in the group. And then uh, 
the volunteers were told to upload their pictures of initial findings also in this line group. And then let me also introduce a little bit about the site we investigated, which is Test Ride Retail. It is a Taiwan local business, but it used to be the sale agent of uh, B&Q from Britain in Taiwan. And for some reason, they stopped uh, representing B&Q now, and they have become a total local business in Taiwan. They had a lot of they have a lot of chain stores in different cities in Taiwan, and they have different product departments such as product in, in the bathrooms for flooring as furniture, for lighting and tools and gardening and so on. And in our pre-action investigation, our staff found that there were PVC products everywhere in the uh, test ride stores. So that's why we decided that this would be the, the company that we want to send volunteers to do the investigation. Okay, so what you can see now on my slides is the data collected by our volunteers. We opened up an online table for all the volunteers to edit so they can key in the information they found in the chain stores. Um, so what they have to put into the table are names of the products and where these products are found in which department of the store and whether they are labeled PVC clearly or not. And uh, most importantly, if it is possible to find alternative materials in the store. And also they had to upload pictures of the product online. So this is the final table as you can see here. And these information are for other consumers to check up if they want to know whether the products they want to buy uh, are made of PVC. So after we accomplished the table, we held an online press conference with some of the volunteers and with one of the legislators who cared about the issue. And uh, the meeting was held uh, online with newspaper journalists. We released the results of the inv investigation to these journalists. And then um, the influence of our com uh, press conference was that uh, test right has responded publicly saying that they promise to rule out PVC products from their shelves someday in the future. So it was kind of successful uh, in terms of um, making the corporation to do some response to the issue. And here are some reflections from our side after doing the project with our citizen members. So from the NGOs, uh, side, we think that it's good because we can expand the scale of the project since we have more people and we can send them to farther places so that we can investigate stores not only in Taipei, but also in other cities in Taiwan. And the best part of it is that was that we can had, have deeper discussion about the issue with these citizen members. These people uh, might not have a lot of opportunities to know so much information about PVC and other plastics, but now we get a chance to talk with them about the issue. Um, however, it did take time for the staff to work on methods and communication with uh, the volunteers uh, because these people were not familiar with the issue. And also some people um, faded out during the process because uh, they simply did not have so much time continuing with the project. So um, it, was, it was the staff's efforts to um, work out some way that is workable for the majority of the group. And um, as for the citizens aspect, it was good for them to take actions in their community, which is a strong motive for most of the volunteers to join us. And uh, through the project, they can also gain further scientific knowledge of the issue, which they're already interested in. And most importantly, uh, it helps to build ownership within the volunteers of the action, um, which means that um, these people will pay more attention to the product ingredients or materials when they have to buy their own furnitures or buy their own products. The project is more likely to become their own project and not just um, something they participated in with a big group. So these are the advantages that we found uh, with this kind of method. Okay, and um, 
in the end, I would like to share about an, an other case which we didn't involve citizens, but uh, we thought might which might be um, suitable for using the method of citizen science. And that is the project of investigating heavy metal pollution accumulated in wild oysters along our coast side. Um, this was a case done by the staff of Taiwan Watch Institute several years ago. But uh, we, as we were preparing for today's presentation, we thought about it and we thought that this might also uh, be a good project for citizens to take a role. Um, for example, citizens can help with data collection in the field or reporting observations on site, or they could also publicize lab analysis results for the scientists. So um, we were thinking that um, we might adopt citizen science method um, better if we are going to um, implement this kind of uh, project in the future. And that would be all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, you can leave a message to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuncha. You see, uh, citizen science is also applicable in increasing consumer awareness and uh, maybe uh, also addressing some uh, toxic uh, issues on consumer products. So thank you very much and we wish you all the best as you continue um, utilizing citizen science, citizen science approach in your work. So thank you very much again, Yuncha, and to all of you at the Taiwan Watch Institute. Thank you. So we will. We still have another interesting topic. So stay with us. So I would like to introduce our our another speaker. He is Mr. Angus Ho, uh, the executive director of the Greeners Action Hong Kong. Uh, Angus Ho devoted in environmental protection and NGO for over twenty five years leading Greener's Action from a voluntary-based NGO to a major professional NGO in Hong Kong. Under his leadership, Greener's Action um, advocacy for different environmental campaigns and policies such as plastic bag levy, legislation, food waste reduction, and reducing single-use plastics in Hong Kong society. So they, uh, they were able to influence that. So. Again, with, without much further ado, um, Angus, over to you. Hi, Hi. thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be invited to uh, sharing my story, uh, Greenest Action's story in Hong Kong, uh, talking about the citizen uh, science. Let me share my PowerPoint first. Yes, yes, we can see yeah. it now. Good. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my topic is talking about the single-use face mask and also the reusable uh, mask and by citizen experience in Hong Kong. So um, I think uh, all of you guys know uh, the disposable facial mask is a very uh, serious problem and also it is a basically a plastic. And so we uh, found that um, there's a lot of problem. So Greener Session is uh, actually established for over 25 years. And we uh, always commit on uh, uh, waste reduction works and also against incinerator and also promoting recycling. So we found that the facial mask uh, in the COVID-19 is a very serious problem in Hong Kong. So we're trying to uh, uh, encourage the public to use the reusable one. So this is today my presentation. I will talking about the uh, uh, two uh, citizen uh, science uh, experience. One is the survey and another one is the focus group and tell how we uh, use the uh, work with the peoples together and then to uh, advocates more people to concern about the uh, single-use uh, facial mask problem. So uh, the background, I don't need to talk so much. I know all of you guys are aware the facial mask is uh, the problem globally, not only in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is also a very serious uh, problem uh, because 
uh, back to 2003, we have a SARS, and so many people is aware the uh, facial mask is very important. So uh, when the COVID-19 start, everyone's uh, try to get uh, the uh, facial mask every day, and even uh, at that time, other countries may not wear the facial mask or they don't have any policies from the government. So that uh, we try to uh, mobilize the public to uh, do an uh, online survey because we, we, we think um, uh, many of the people, they don't understand the problem of the facial mask and also they don't have the, uh, enough information about the reusable facial mask. Is it a reusable meanings of uh, unsafe or not have good protection, something like that? So that we uh, ask the people on the uh, ha habits how they use the facial mask, and also we uh, make some uh, try to make some recommendation on uh, how how should they use the um, uh, facial mask in a more sustainable way. So in back to the October 2020, we uh, conducted an online survey and uh, luckily we uh, got a uh, 1,000 uh, response uh, over maybe a week only. So uh, the response is quite fast and which is, um, we found that um, over uh, 2 billion of the disposable plastic uh, facial masks has been used and it is all uh, almost equal to two, uh, 200 million of the plastic bottle disposed uh, uh, mostly in the landfill in Hong Kong. So that uh, after we announced our results, we got some newspaper, we got some um, um, uh, publicity, and then uh, up to now, uh, according to our survey and our proportional calculation, in Hong Kong, there's a uh, over uh, 5.4 billion of uh, disposable facial masks has been dumped. And it is over 5 million, um, 100 million of plastic bottles being used. So uh, we are thinking why people use those uh, single use facial masks rather than the reusable masks. And we found that 81 of the uh, respondents claim that they think that the single-use facial mask is having higher level of protection. Of course, this is not true. And also 81% of, of the respondent claim that the uh, single-use facial mask is more hygienic than the reusable one. And most of them, uh, they also, uh, they are paying attention or they are concerning about the filtration efficient. You know, there's uh, in the facial mask, they have a BFE, PFE, and also VFE. So that we also uh, try to find out uh, all those reusable facial masks, how, how the protective level they are. And, how, and then we found that 99% uh, of the respondent claims that they actually, they do not know or do not understand about the reusable mask. They don't have uh, enough information. And 80% of them, uh, they uh, understand and they claim they uh, understand well. They will, uh, about the uh, reusable mask, actually they are, they are usually using the single use uh, uh, facial mask. So um, that means I, I think that um, if they have more understanding about the reusable facial mask, they will uh, uh, have a change of their habits and they will change to use the reusable one rather than the single use one. So uh, after that, uh, we find the, um, in the market and then we find there is a, actually some quite a few brand names. They are pro providing the reusable one and they have different uh, quality and they have different methods. And we find that uh, for example, you can see on the tables, uh, over 95% of BFE, which is uh, quite, quite good. Actually, we found 10 of 10 models in the markets. They are already higher than 95%. And also, we also found nine, uh, 10, 10 of uh, the models in the markets. They actually have um, more than 95% of PFE. So that, that means uh, actually, the facial, uh, the uh, 
reusable one. Actually, it's not safe, not unsafe, and they are also hygiene. They are also have a good level of protection, so that we want to uh, linkage those um, uh, knowledge to the peoples and help them. Uh, they can uh, change their mindsets and use the reusable one. So that after that, uh, we find that uh, there's a mislinkage be between the people, uh, their understanding, and also the fact is the reusable one is actually is also very safe. So that we uh, try to use another uh, focus group. We want to em empower the peoples and not, not using environmental groups mouth to tell them it is good or it is not good. And we try to invite the people uh, from uh, social media and we uh, invite them to have a focus group and then we uh, want to uh, have a better understanding of the reusable mask. And also they can uh, choosing different uh, reusable mesial masks and also they can uh, compare with the single use one. And then we want them to share their opinions to the media and then rather than using the environmental group or NGOs. So that we uh, have a trial period about uh, 12 days. We give, uh, uh, we find six people from the public, from the social media, we recruit them. And then we uh, give different um, type of uh, reusable facial masks for them to choose, to, to, to test and then to ask them to use, and then they need to record their feelings or their condition, or is it a convenience, or they feel that, is it, is it good or is it bad, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a seminar on uh, after the 12 days uh, use uh, experience, and then we make a seminar and then we tell the media, uh, have a media session uh, in the January in 2021. Uh, so that um, according to score uh, uh, given by the uh, public, and then we find that the, uh, actually the, the score is quite good. Overall average uh, out of the five points, they give uh, the reusable mass have a three, um, four point, and then uh, they also have a different uh, facial mass. There's a three, three different type of facial mass. One is a silicon, one is a filter cloth, one is a uh, long re replaceable filter cloth uh, mask, etc., so that they have a different marking to the different type of the reusable one, so that uh, we can find that uh, actually different types have a different feeling from the public, and then they can share to the media and then tell actually uh, the reusable one is also uh, have uh, uh, good and bad, and also they can tell them their, their confidence to the reusable one. So that uh, uh, the citizens we ask uh, positively to the reusable mask. So we find that uh, using the public and the citizen experience and also opinions, and also it is a more uh, persuasive less to uh, and then uh, the NGOs. If only NGOs, we say that because of the uh, uh, care the environments, you should use the reusable one. But now we use the citizens and use their, their opinions, use their experience, and to tell the people, we, we find that it's more convincing. So that um, the whole uh, experience is, uh, we, uh, first of all, we do the online survey in October 2020, and then, um, and then we use a, uh, we conduct a reusable mass survey we, uh, to understand the markets, actually they are providing different reusable masks. So you have a choice in the market. And then we use a, a focus group, which is also a citizen experience and citizen science. And then to uh, try to have a trial of the reusable mask. And then we find that there's uh, more citizen involvement actually is uh, more close to the reality. And uh, it is an actual experience by them but not only uh, telling by the NGO or the green groups so that they, it is more convincing. So that um, uh, I think that the whole um, uh, program is uh, more uh, uh, using the citizen science and citizen experience. It is much more better than the uh, NGOs. We are telling the people, we are promoting to the people. It is not enough uh, encouragement to the public 
uh, to use the um, environmental friendly ways to use the reusable uh, facial mask. So uh, this is my uh, short presentation, and uh, I hope that uh, you guys also can um, encourage more people to involve to the citizen science and also to involve to the environmental uh, campaign. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Angus, and thank you so much, Greeners Action Hong Kong. You see, even in the issues, in the health issues, uh, we can also uh, utilize citizen science and we can really help increase the awareness of the people and even them experience themselves and be provided with healthier options that can harm less the environment so thank you thank you so much angus and of course to all of you at the greeners action so i'm really sorry that it's already 6 12 but i think i if you agree with me that all our speakers have presented very well their initiatives are all amazing and are all great and hopefully that in the future we'll be able to connect everyone to another discussion and of course uh Connect, uh, we can also connect with you with the speakers after this we can provide you with a copy of their presentations if they allow and of course their uh, uh, emails also all right so sorry that I cannot uh, we will not uh, have the open forum now but we, just to connect connect you with the speakers later but um, since it's already 6 12 may I request Miss Eileen Lucero the national coordinator of the eco waste coalition for her closing message Miss I okay so thank you Chinky um, my profound greetings to everyone who attended today's detox session on citizen science especially to all our speakers who shared their time and knowledge on respective areas and concerns for us to really understand how citizen science works and the challenges we could encounter. Citizen science is the practice of public participation and collaboration to increase scientific knowledge. And through this citizen science, people share and contribute to data monitoring and collection programs. Also known as community science, it enables members of frontline and vulnerable communities to launch a study on issues that matters most to them and definitely not industry push. With this, let's continue to collaborate and provide a medium to share our initiatives regionally, globally. Again, on behalf of the International Pollutants Elimination Network, IPEN, Southeast and East Asia region, Citizen Science Asia, Ecological Alert and Recovery Thailand, Earth, and ECOWAS Coalition, our sincerest gratitude to all for attending this year's first detox session on Citizen Science, a strategic approach to solving toxic waste and chemical issues in the sea region. See you all on our next webinar. Good day. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. I. Thank you so much to our speakers and everyone who are still for staying with us. Thank you again, everyone. So I think it's time to say goodbye. Bye. And please keep safe, everyone. Bye, everyone.